Well, my name is Jonathan Adelstein. I'm the CEO of WIA, the Wireless Infrastructure Association. As of today, I got a same old job, but it's actually a new job because we have a new name. Uh, we were the PCIA going back to 1995, but we've outgrown that name. Really, it's no longer applicable. We're no longer in the personal communications industry. We're in the infrastructure business. Our members build and develop and maintain wireless networks and infrastructure. So we now are, more simply put, I think a more direct name that really reflects our membership and, and where we're at. Wireless infrastructure is our, is our mission. Well, you know, 5G is a little ways down the track and about 2020 we'll see it, but already we're seeing carriers invest. Even here today there's an announcement in Dallas that they're putting fiber deeper into the network in preparation for needing fiber to all of these antennas that are going to be carrying the 5G signals. 5G is, is much more efficient than 4G, but given the demands that we're seeing from consumers, it's really going to be necessary in order to meet the skyrocketing demand. Along with that, there's going to be a need for more capacity on macro towers, on small cells, on distributed antenna systems. All of that's going to have to be uh, upgraded in order to accommodate 5G. But in the end, it'll help us keep up with the soaring demand for data by consumers. We expect over 600% increase in data use over the next five years. And there's not enough spectrum coming online to deal with that. We're going to need more cell sites, a lot more cell sites in order to do that. And those cell sites in a 5G world need to be connected to fiber. So that's why we're seeing these investments. We're seeing a lot of the attention kind of counterintuitively on the wireline system, but it's preparing for a major wireless uh, investment that's coming soon. Yeah, we see cycles of investment and deployment in this business. We've seen them come and go for years, but the cycles have always gone up and up and up. It might go down a little bit in the long run. It's always increased because the data demand is never slow. It is always sped up. And so what we're seeing right now is we're somewhere in the middle. We're not in a dynamic growth phase, but there's a low for a number of reasons. You have FirstNet that some companies are thinking of investing in. You're waiting for 5G. There's an auction going on now, which could cost a lot of capital. Companies have made expensive acquisitions. They've developed a lot of the 4G networks. They're still completing that, but a lot of the 4G has been done. And so that source of a big burst of investment is not available. So we're in a sort of a, a low period, is what some of the members described, but nobody seems to believe it's going to last. That it's only a matter of time before the investment will come back in force in order to meet the capacity demands of, of the end users. Well, Dave Mayo talked this morning from T-Mobile about industrialization of small cell deployment. He's talking about coming up with a very uh, systematic way of getting it done. Right now, most small cell deployments are customized for the individual deployment, and they're not done in a sort of streamlined fashion. So it's very expensive, and one of the things that's sort of slowed the deployment of small cells and DAS are a lot of the costs that come with not only customization, but expenses for backhaul, for siting, for site acquisition, for uh, rent. You know, the, the system has not sort of gelled yet in a way that it's as cost efficient as a lot of companies would like it to be. And when it becomes more cost efficient, the thinking is there would be a real explosion in deployment because that's the way that they can help to meet demand. So we're, we're looking at removing regulatory barriers. We've already removed the idea that a small cell node is the same as a, as a large macro tower so that you look at the systems as a whole. There's a lot of uh, regulatory work going on now at the FCC to exempt certain types of deployments from Section 106 Historic Preservation Review and from National Environmental uh, Protection Act Review. So we're making, I think, the case and policymakers are listening and responding. And they need to respond on a local level as well because some local communities, like some here in Texas, are demanding exorbitant rates for rights of way. And the companies that are building these networks don't have unlimited capital. People think all oh, the wireless companies must be doing great. But what's happening is because of the price war that's going on, there's sort of a squeeze on the profit margins. At the same time, consumers are demanding more and more quality in order to stick with a, a carrier. And people can switch easily from one carrier to another. It's not like switching from your bank, which it takes a huge amount of work. All you have to do is call the other company, your bill changes, and you're done. So they're competing on quality. At the same time, they're not getting more revenue coming in because there's a 
people cutting bills in half and, and price wars. So it's great for the consumer. But when it comes to a very expensive build of a network, it's really putting uh, the squeeze on everybody throughout the wireless infrastructure ecosystem. We are seeing a real skills gap growing in the wireless infrastructure industry where there aren't enough people that are trained in radio frequency engineering and trained in the basics of radio frequency dynamics to understand when they're out there in the field deploying these things what it means. As we get more and more antennas closer to the end user, there's more opportunities for harmful interference. There's more need for education. There's also more need for training on the specifics of how do you deploy these networks? How do you get the, uh, the, the cabling in place? How do you connect the antennas? How do you make sure that they are optimized? Uh, there's a real shortage of people that know what they're doing and we're seeing a lot of rework getting done. Things being installed, a lot of it not properly, and there's a need, I think, for a massive change. So we've stepped up as WIA. We're establishing a training program. We want to teach the basics of RF, teach the basics of you know, small cell and DAS installation, teach the basics of, of tower climbing safety and things like that so that folks are on the same page when it comes to the basics. And then they can go to have training from individual companies or equipment manufacturers or the company they're going to work for that can take them into even a deeper level, but they'll have a broad-based understanding of the milieu in which they're operating. For the first time, we are introducing a supplier diversity summit here at our annual wireless infrastructure show. And it's really exciting because we have all the major carriers participating. We have the big tower companies engaged. And they want to see more diversity in their supply chain because it strengthens their opportunities to get the work done properly. The more we can bring in small businesses, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, I think the better off we all are. We find that there won't be reliance on a, on a handful of suppliers. It, it brings up the level of, of competition. It brings in diverse voices and different viewpoints and different skills. So it's something that is embraced by the members of WIA, and it's something that is being embraced by the supplier community where we've had a huge turnout of people here to meet one-on-one. -on -one. We've set up a system where they can meet one-on-one -on -one with carriers, with, with uh, infrastructure companies, and introduce themselves so that both the carriers and the infrastructure companies meet new uh, potential vendors, ones that might have a, a diverse background, and it's really a, a, a great opportunity for both the uh, contractor, in this case the large companies and the vendors, the diverse companies that have joined us here at, at the show to engage in the Diversity Summit. So we're bringing diversity right into the heart of our trade association. Often you see these issues are handled in a diversity uh, organization meeting. But this is in a trade association meeting of the industry itself. We think it's going to be more effective that way. It's a new model for a lot of other industries. So we not only have a new name, we have a new website as well, WIA.org, where we have new white papers that we've put up for people to look at. We have a lot of new material. It's really designed to be helpful to, to members and the public alike to understand what's happening in the wireless infrastructure industry, what are some of the regulatory issues that we're facing, and it's uh, something I hope everybody gets a chance to take a look at and take advantage of. And uh, now I think it's clear that we represent wireless infrastructure. We've got a clear name, we got a clear website, and we're really excited going forward.